Am I on? Good morning. Welcome to Las Vegas. My name is Paul Kautz. I'm the Director of Education for TDWI, and uh, I'm the one responsible for all these classes you're sitting in this week, the educational content and the instructors, so I'd like to hear feedback, things you like, things you don't like, and hope you get a lot out of the class. We've got over 55 full and half day classes this week, as well as our executive summit that's starting today. Um, but it's not just about the education and the classes. I want to encourage all of you to take the time to get to know the people at your table, to get to know the people around the room, and network, because one of the biggest opportunities you have to learn here is from each other, from the different industries you're in, the different pieces, they, they, problems they've solved, problems you're trying to solve. So please take the time and in, in, uh, do the networking opportunities and enjoy the week. How many of you are going to be here through Thursday and Friday? Okay, I've, I've, I've got a mental note of all of your faces. I expect you to be here bright and early on Thursday morning, too, for the keynote. Because I know as the week goes on, it gets a little tougher to get up in the morning. But a couple of house cleaning announcements I have. <clears throat> Classes will start at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, and they'll be down, the breakfast will be downstairs where it was yesterday morning. It's a little confusing. We're up and down a little bit. Um, also, to the lunch today, you have, we'll have lunch uh, sponsored in this room today, courtesy of MicroStrategy. So you'll be right back in this room for lunch, uh, courtesy of MicroStrategy, as I said. And also check your program guide, because after class today, there's some more networking opportunities with, uh, with some hospitality suites and some case studies. Also, we are streaming this today um, uh, live. So it's tdwi.org slash live. We have a live web page out there. Uh, so feel free to... to uh, to get your phones out and uh, tweet about the things during the week, about uh, Frank's presentation, and uh, check out our live, our live page, if you will. So um, with that, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Frank Botendyke. Frank is one of the world's leading experts in performance management and is known for his out-of-the-box and forward-thinking approach. Frank has more than 20 years of experience as a consultant and industry strategist, uh, he was VP at Gartner, and before that held top consulting position in his home country of the Netherlands. So he just flew in last night, um, and it's in the middle of night for him probably now, so he should be wide awake. Um, Frank currently has two books out, uh, one called Performance Leadership and the other Dealing with Dilemmas. And he's in just about done with his third book, and he won't tell me what the title is because he hasn't figured it out yet. So maybe he'll, uh, he'll share a little more of that today. Um, two years ago... Frank did the keynote for us in Las Vegas, uh, but he didn't have a lot of time to stick around. He, the, we rang the bell at 45 minutes into his presentation, and he bolted out of here. Uh, he got home just in time, he says within 30 seconds, to witness the birth of his, uh, his youngest daughter. And by the way, Frank, we're still looking for that lav mic back because you went out with it. We'd like that back sometime. Okay. Uh, but Frank has a little more time um, to stay with us this week, uh, matter of fact, he's conducting two workshops on Wednesday with us, and it's always a surprise to see what Frank has to say, but I'm sure it'll be thought-provoking and a very good start to our conference. So with that, I give you Frank Boutenbeck. Best practices are the solutions for yesterday's problems, and sometimes you just need to reinvent yourself with technology taking away so many boundaries and lifting so many constraints um, in terms of scale, in terms of power, the question moves. The question moves from how are we going to achieve things, which are the best practices today, and it moves to what on earth are we going to do with all those powers? And those are fundamentally questions of philosophy. So what I'm going to do today, this morning, is a bit dangerous. We're going to talk about philosophy at 8 a.m. in the morning. So to get us going, I'm going to get starting with a really simple question. How many philosophers does it take to change a light bulb? Anyone? Take a wild guess. Shout. Five. five. Anyone more than five? Fifteen. Zero. Zero. Uh, Maybe it's not even, maybe we shouldn't talk about answers here, but, but ponder on the question a little bit. If you want to change your light bulb, shouldn't you first know what is a light bulb? And that leads to the question, what does it mean to be a light bulb? What is to be, actually? 
As you can see, this is a little bit what, about, well, what, what we think of, of philosophy within three questions. We sort of float away on a pinky cloud. No wonder that philosophy isn't very popular at the executive floor. It's a little bit like we as analysts do. We go around and ask people questions like, say, how would you define sales? And then the sales guy says, well, sales is the stuff that I bring in every day. Do you have, do you have any other smart questions? Go away. So who of you, let's test it again, who of you has this view on philosophy? Philosophy was fun in university. You're sure you're going to study it again when you're retired, but right now I've got a bit of a job to do. Anyone? Yeah? Good. Who of you has the opposite view? Philosophy is the most important thing in the world. It is, I use it every day. It's even more important than coffee to me. Okay, apart from the coffee bit, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe there's something to be said for both views. Let me introduce you to Thales. Thales was the first recorded Greek philosopher. And Thales was an astronomer as well. And he looked at weather patterns. And he thought about what he could do in the field of predictions. He was one of the first people who made predictions based on thinking things through. And he thought on the island it was going to be a great olive season based on the weather patterns. And he thought, what can I do with that prediction? Should it come true? And he figured that the best course of action would be to buy all the olive presses on the island and see what would happen. And indeed, it was a great olive season. He rented out all olive presses and became filthy rich over the summer. So that is how practical philosophy can be. On the other hand, there's a story about Thales where he was found lying in a ditch by a farmer's girl. And the farmer's girl was laughing at him while he was lying in the ditch. And she told him, what is it good to, what does it do to look at the stars when you don't even know what is right in front of your feet? So there's something to be said for both views. But I do believe that philosophy is rather important, particularly today, for a number of reasons. Philosophy teaches you how to think and stand on the shoulder of giants. Every problem that you encounter in the business world today has been solved by the old Greek philosophers ages ago. Do you want to know about enterprise architecture? Don't read Zuckman. Read Aristotle. He's been writing about it. Do you want to hear anything about competency centers and governance? Read Plato. He's been writing about it. What if you are struggling with power in the company and, and power structures in the company? Who should you read? Machiavelli. Has anyone read Machiavelli's The Prince? It's a surprisingly easy and fun read, isn't it? It's not like hard to read at all. If you would want to hear about strategy, what you should, should you read? You should read Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Uh, lots of business people have read that book. Everything you could possibly want to know about uh, things you're working on today in your company, the, the great philosophers have been writing about already. Philosophy also teaches you there are different ways of thinking. There's different types of logic that can coexist. So if you're working in a very shareholder value-driven environment, your data strategy is going to look one way. If you're looking in a very stakeholder-oriented um, environment, your data strategy is going, to look in, is going to look entirely different, but both can be equally logic and can be equally right. Philosophy also helps you question your own thinking. Every time you do an analysis, every time you look at something and you make a statement about it, the statement that you make or the document that you come up with tells you as much about the object of your analysis as it tells you about you, because it is you who are the analyst, it is you who did the analysis. If you are able to figure out which bit is truly objective, if there even is such a thing, and which bit of yours, you've improved the quality of your work. And perhaps the most important thing, philosophy helps you rediscover those elementary questions that you need to ask yourself once in a while to get grounded again. And today we're going to play around, nothing more, with just three very simple questions. One, what is true? Two, what is real? And three, what is good? Those are simple questions, aren't they? Nice and easy for a Monday morning. The answers, I don't know. Let's have a look. So, in our industry, the most, uh, one of the most influential books is competing on analytics, right? Particularly here in Las Vegas, the moment you get out of the, uh, out of the airplane, they start analyzing you already every step. You take every breath you take. What does the rest of the police song go? Something like that. 
Um, and it's a book that perhaps we've all read and that we've shared um, in the office. Perhaps not a book that you learn a lot from as a professional, but definitely the perfect book to give away because there was no other book that explained it so well. Competing on analytics is sort of the Bible in our field at the moment. From the field of medication, we hear more and more about evidence-based management. And all decisions should be based on facts because that is what we need in this economy, and that is what we need in the Western world. Predictive analytics are all the rage. Uh, let's do the number crunching. Let's bring in all the tools to make sure that we can get the maximum out of our data. Everything needs to be fact-based. So let's look at how fact-based decision-making really can be. And we're going to use, I'm not going to do a lot of theory, uh, but we're going to use a model from a philosophy field called rhetorics, how to set up a decent argument to, to play around with that. We're going we're gonna to talk about a, a decision-making process. And I collected a few examples that perhaps uh, we can all relate to. Perhaps tonight uh, in the news you'll hear something like, criminality is up. There should be more police in the streets. That is an insight, and it is actionable, isn't it? That is what we do. In, uh, in our discipline, in our field, we try to create actionable insights. Criminality is up. We should have more police. Or another one, perhaps that's something that can be found in your organizations. Everyone has fill-in, technology trend, X, Y, or Z. We should do that too. That's an insight. You learn someone that everyone is doing it. Perhaps you learned it at the conference here. We should do that too is the, is the action. Or uh, something that we can relate to as a, as a citizen, as a human being. I didn't pay for the parking meter. I should get fined. There's an insight and there's an action. Who of you think that these are really good actionable insights? Or is there something missing? What is wrong with these insights? The bit in the middle is sort of missing, right? It's, it sounds like really actionable, but is that really the right course of action? If a criminality is up, maybe there is too much police in the streets and police is only provoking criminality. Perhaps um, criminality is up and it is not it's not related to police at all. And whether you do more police or less police, it's just other factors driving it. You don't really know the bit is in the middle. You need to set up a decent argument and to do that, we're going to use the last example. I didn't pay for the parking meter, so I should get fined. Says who? Says where? Says the law, right? That's where we write down, that's where we wrote down that there are certain rules and we need to stick to those rules. And one of the rules is that if there's a parking meter, then you should pay for it. What would be, um, let me turn the question around, what would be a good reason to pay for a parking meter? Think about it for a second. Why do we pay for the parking meter? Why do we make that decision every day when we go into town? One reason might be because you do the math. Um, you sort of figure out the chances that you're getting caught, which is, let's say, 40%. You multiply by the, um, by the fine that you're going to get. You're going to compare that to the number of hours that you're going to stay times the amount per hour, and there is your decision. Isn't that a wonderful way of coming to the conclusion that it is better to pay for the parking meter? Someone else might say, I'm coming to the same decision, but based on entirely different grounds. It is because it is the law. And we as people said that we should stick to the law. If we start breaking the law, where does it stop? It starts now with, I don't pay for the parking meter. Tomorrow, it is shoplifting. The day after, it is murder and rape. It's a slippery slope. We cannot decide which laws to break and which ones not. Is what the judge told me when I got caught driving too fast again. And my line of argument was that it was Sunday morning really early on a highway that was totally empty. Another reason could be that you think like, ah, yet another opportunity to contribute to the city and the welfare and the things that the city does for all the people that need it more than I do. That's the Good Samaritan line of argument. All types of ways, all different reasons why we think it is better to pay for the parking meter. Should we always pay for the parking meter or are there exceptions? When do you not pay for the parking meter? Yeah, because on Sundays and uh, when there's festivities, you don't have to pay. Or after 11 p.m. or 9 p.m., depending on the part of the city, you don't have to pay. 
Maybe um, you have, um, um, you, you're a doctor and you have one of these stickers in your car that means you can pay where you can basically park wherever you want. You don't have to pay anything because you're exempt from paying. Um, or um, uh, how much is it to pay in the middle of, uh, who, how much does it cost to pay in the middle of San Francisco for an hour, in the middle of New York? Anyone? How many dollars per hour? Sorry? In the cent, in, like in Manhattan Center, three dollars an hour? They don't have parking meters. Oh, yeah. In and sorry, fifteen. I just wanted to say like five euros per hour in Amsterdam is like legal, Robert. Fifteen dollars per hour. That is that is just stealing money from you with a license, right? That sh- that is not right. For the first fifteen hour, fifteen for the first hour. That is that is wrong. I say, what happens if next time? Tomorrow, none of us pay. Revolution. (laughs) Let's see who wins. Tomorrow is going to be national. Don't pay for the parking meter in Manhattan City Center Day National Event. What do you think? (laughs) Something like that. That could be a good reason. Many laws, many customs, many things have changed over years because we as a people felt it wasn't the right thing. So there are certain disqualifiers as well. And then at the end, you've come at your line, you come at your line of argument. Um, but we could continue discussing this for the, le- for the next 50 minutes. There's one key question that I would want to ask. Which bit in this whole line of argumentation was based on fact, was based on real measurement, was based on true observation? Which bit? I didn't pay for the parking meter. About 2% of our whole line of argumentation is actually fact-based. The rest is uh, what we agree upon. The rest is what we believe in. The rest is what we discuss with each other, what we, how we feel about things. Most of decision-making isn't about measurement and observation and true facts at all. It is, um, it is about, it's about us. It's about how we feel, what we think. And that is going to get only worse because big data is here. The coolest prediction I saw actually is a little bit uh, older already from 2009 coming from IDC who made a very convincing argument that between 2009 and 2020 the amount of data in the world is going to grow 44-fold. So look at 2009 or look at now for for that matter, uh, same, same order of magnitude. And then think of like just like eight or ten years from now, we're going to have to handle 44 times the data we are handling right now. That is just amazing, right? That is just, we cannot even conceive how much data that is. Let's even assume we're going to have all the technologies, all the hardware, all the software to capture all that data. It's going to be so fast, it's going to grow so fast that the only moment we can do something with the data is right now. Oh, it's gone again. Hmm. Didn't have time to think about it. What was that? Coffee? No, thank you. Oh, shoot, missed another opportunity. This is how fast decision-making needs to be. The more data, the more subjective decision-making is going to be. Moreover, there's another prediction that talks about the growth of infrastructure. The data sizes are going to explode, infrastructure is going to grow as well, but not that fast. That means that for the years to come, we'll only see the gap between the amount of data, the volume of data, and the infrastructure to copy it around. That gap is only growing. Today, there are already data centers that can't keep their, um, their data centers like uh, synchronous at all times through the bandwidth that they have. They have fallen back to dumping data on tapes or whatever other media and FedEx them around. Basically, they have to plan for the data to travel. The data is so big, it becomes individualized. You have to plan for everything. You could even argue that data sets becoming very big and very complex and very voluminous and growing very fast almost become like people, become like individuals, like a big DNA pattern. You could argue you need to plan for the travel. Um, You ask questions to a data set and what is in there is so much and it is so complex that you can't really track back where the answer comes from. You just need to believe it. 
Data sets over time could become dysfunctional. They could start to have erratic behaviors. Mark my words, the coolest job in 2020 is going to be being a data therapist, figuring out where it all went wrong. So, ah, a little childhood trauma. <laughs> Who is sponsoring the lunch today? Microstrategy. Ah, we didn't give the baby enough microstrategy when it was young. Something like that. It is going to, data is going to be individualized. We are going to see the days of postmodern IT. And let's have a look at what that means. This is the first postmodern philosophy, philosopher that we have known. Do you know who this is? 2000 years old? Yeah, this is the philosopher Brian. Who of you have seen the life of Brian? Yeah, do you remember the famous scene? Brian is hiding from all his followers, and in the morning he is opening up the, the, the windows of the house of his mother, and there all his followers are on the square, and they start shouting and cheering, and then Brian has this famous speech. Remember the speech? And there's this fantastic line in this speech where, where Brian says, like, listen, listen, you're all individuals. And then the whole crowd is cheering with one voice, we are all individuals. Except for the tiny guy in the back who was jumping and said, I'm not, I'm not. It's hilarious. But this was, this, was forecast, this was forecasting the future. This is the situation where we are in today. We live in a postmodern society. It just took the IT world almost 100 years to catch up with reality and to see that we are further away from the one version of the truth than we have ever been. There is no one version of the truth anymore with um, exploding data sizes. Every time you ask a data set something, it'll come up with a different answer, and the answer is incomparable to other answers that you get from different data sets. You cannot, you cannot figure out anymore whether the answer is correct or incorrect. The only thing you have time for, the only thing you can comprehend is to figure out if you trust that number based on the context or if you trust that data source based on earlier experience, like asking questions to people. If I ask something to Paul, I probably know that what he's going to say is very reliable. If I would ask the question to someone else who has no clue, I would ask someone on the street, I'm not sure about the quality of the answer. Managing an organization being responsible for organization's performance is not going to be about true or not true anymore. It's going to be about trust and collaboration. Basically, what managing and making decisions has always been about. Make up your own mind. So, let's move on to the next bit. What is real? Um, who of you know this painting? Of what this painting stands for? Who of you know the story of Plato's cave? Heard about Plato's cave? That's a cool story, isn't it? For those of you who haven't heard it yet, let me quickly recap. Plato was a weird guy. He wrote a story 2,500 years ago about a number of prisoners that were in, in, in chains in a cave, and they had been there all their lives. They were sitting um, at, a, at a little wall, with a little wall in their back, and all they could see was the wall in front of them, a little bit like this, uh, like this ballroom, the wall over there. And behind them, there was a, a big, here it is, behind them there's a big fire, and then there's people walking back and forth behind them and in between the fire. So what the people and the animals that are walking back and forth do is cast shadows on the wall of the other side, and because the, the, the cave is like a round structure, even their voices and their sounds come back as an echo. So all the prisoners see are the shadows on the wall, and for them that is reality. It's all they've seen their lives. That is how, that's what they made sense out of. This is how we learn as human beings. To give you an example, my, my oldest daughter, who's now 12, I think she must have been around 5, when, she was, when we were walking in the, in the street in the city, and all of a sudden she stood still, she stood still looking at this guy, and with her mouth open like this, uh, and it's like, that's really impolite, don't look at that person, come on, let's, let's go, and I asked her, like, what's, what's that? And he says, well, and it was a big Scandinavian guy, and then she said, well, the guy had like a big beard, so it's a guy, but he also had long blonde hair like me, so it's a girl. 
So all of a sudden, she had to adopt her mo- adapt her model of the world because it wasn't as she thought it was. She had to change her rule. This is how we learn. We, um, uh, we look at, uh, we interpret our way around it. And for the prisoners, all they can interpret are the shadows of... Is, is Plato a weird guy or what to come up with a story like that? And he makes it even stranger. He says, what would happen if one of those people all of a sudden would break free, would get up, and would start interacting with the people behind him, talking to them, even go outside the cave, see the sunshine, look at the fields, look at the sky, look at the clouds, and come back to his fellow prisoners and tell about the real world outside. What would they do with him? They would ridicule him, they would spit at him, and I'm so happy that they are chained because otherwise they would have killed him, right? That is, what have, is that a weird, twisted, sick story or what? And we are so much further um, as humanity now, right? We understand that shadows on the wall are not reality, right? We know so much more these days. Would you agree? Or not? Because every time we sit behind a computer screen and we look at a graph or we draw a process with a little box to go left and to go right, we are looking at shadows of reality. Every time we um, look at a graph... We are not looking at what is happening. Every minute you spend behind the computer, reality is happening behind you. Did I just kill a multi-billion market or what? (laughs) We should know better than that. We should not think that reality is in the data. We should not think that if we have all the predictive analytics in the world, we understand what is going outside, what is going on out there. Not at all. It may be a nice indication. It may be a first mental model that you build to have a framework of understanding. But after that, it is important to go out and check and ask. We should adopt something that I call messy analytics. First of all, whenever you have a large data set, you shouldn't immediately filter out all the outliers. The outliers are the first signal of change. And change is something that we've all been carefully trained to ignore in our companies. Because it doesn't fit in the system, it doesn't fit in our strategy, it doesn't fit in the way how we think. But they are the first signs of change. In fact, I think we should go a little bit further and we should adopt a principle that the academics call perturbation. Now, I'm here speaking for a largely native um, English audience, so you know this word perturbation. The first time I saw the word perturbation, I didn't dare to Google it because I was afraid the filter in the company would kick in. But it is a perfectly normal word I learned in the meantime, and it means to mess up stuff, to create disturbances. And one um, area where they do so already and do so very well is actually is at customs at the airport. At the moment, you have your hand luggage, and it needs to go through the x-ray. There's a guy or a girl sitting there looking at the little collars on the little screen and see if what is in your, what's in your luggage, right? And you have to be very focused in that job. You need to be very... Um, you, need to, you need to take care of it, that you don't miss a thing because something dangerous might be in there. The chances of that happening are very remote. So what do you need to do in order to keep focused? They've come up with an incredibly clever solution. The software, around two or three times in your shift, is going to project something in a random bag that is not supposed to be there, to be there and your job is to spot it. So the moment you see something in the bag... Uh, that is uh, um, uh, illegal, a knife or a gun or any fluid larger than 100 milliliters, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you hit that button, and then the system either says, ha, ha, gotcha, or it says, yeah, really, you should check this back, and there's something in there. If you're missing those clues, you're going to have a conversation with your, uh, with your manager. So this keeps the people focused in what is otherwise a very difficult job. It even, it even introduces an, an element of of, of, of yeah, game and, and, and fun in it. Can you spot the, um, the, anomaly, the anomalies in your, in your watch? Um, I also think we should do more qualitative research and simply be out there. Most of the retail chains that I know require that all their, executive, all their executives work at least one weekend or one week a year in one of the actual shops. And I've also heard uh, of an American, I even saw an episode or two of an American TV show called Undercover Boss. Have you seen that? 
that's a really cool TV show. Like, uh, that, that's like, almost like a real-life soap. And then, oh, yeah, there's this new guy who's going to walk around as well. And that actually is the CEO with a blonde wig and a moustache, right? So, so that no one recognizes it. And what is invariably the end of the show? What, what, does the, what does the CEO say at the end of the week? That, oh, my goodness, I had no idea. With all the management reports, with all the balance scorecards, with all the performance indicators, with a complete back office giving him all the information about the performance in his company, he says, I had no idea. This is how important qualitative research could be. So, wonderful that we have customer surveys and statistics and that we score a 7.9 out of 10 or whatever, but it is not the end of the analysis. It is the start of taking it, going out there and walk in the middle of reality. Don't look at shadows on the wall. Now, let's move to the most interesting bit of all. What is good? How do we build the business case for analytics? What is a good business case? That we create a more efficient organization? That we create a more effective organization? Or are there also moral and ethical concerns in what we do? With technology lifting, as I mentioned, so many constraints and, um, and so many boundaries disappearing, we can analyze about everything on the spot. You have an idea? Poof! There the answer is. Another idea? Poof! There the answer is. But where does it stop? This question we never reached because we didn't, simply didn't have the technology to uh, um, answer all the questions that we had. But this is a question that we are being uh, confronted with more and more. I'm going to share a couple of examples with you. Stuff may be possible, but is it right? I think this is the most analytic, the most important analytical question we can ask ourselves for the years to come. So, close your eyes for a second and assume you are an analyst in an insurance company. And you just read this morning in the newspaper that, that scientists have found a strong correlation, not causality, a strong correlation between sitting too long behind your PC, too many hours a day, and having neck and shoulder problems. Do you think that that is a, a would, that, would you believe that piece of research? Would you, if you would read it? Okay. You know that your insurance company, a little bit over a year ago, launched this massively popular community website, uh, something like Facebook, where all your people, that all the people that are insured with you all around the world can interact with each other and discuss who the best doctors are, like your local Yelp type of thing, um, um, discuss uh, what the best treatments are, uh, what kind of tips and tricks they have for their health, diet things, etc. You have people contributing from the company as well. And as an analyst, you have access also to the web log data. So you take the web log data, you rank the users from who is spending the most time on the community to the ones who are spending the least time. You cross-correlate that with the claims data. And ta-da, there is the correlation. Your insured people that spend the most time on the community also have more back and neck problems. Slap them with higher, higher premiums, I say. <laughs> Micro-segmentation. Predictive analytics. Who of you would feel good about this analysis? analysis? Yes, I've created yet another bit of shareholder value today. No one? Come on, you can do this. This is all that you have the technology at your fingertips. Who of you say like, eh, I'm not sure if that is the right thing to do? Why not? What is wrong with this? What is fishy? First of all, you're not doing your business model a service. Insurance is not about micro-segmentation. It's the opposite. If you apply micro-segmentation to an insurance environment, basically the only conclusion is that everyone who hands in a claim is unprofitable or affects profitability, customer profitability in a negative way and therefore should be kicked out. That's not a very good business model. Uh, furthermore, you are on one hand side, you are attracting people with all the marketing budget you have to spend as much time and to contribute as much as they can to the community website. And the moment they do, you just slap them in the face. And you didn't even ask for consent. So this would be an unethical analysis. You should have known better. So, okay, 
In a parallel universe, it's the same day, you're the same analyst, you read the same bit of research in the morning about the correlation between neck and back problems and spending too much time behind your computer, and you create an alternative research design. You post a survey on the community website with only three questions. You tell people that it's part of the prevention, the, 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 the prevention program to improve health of all the insured people. You ask them these questions, you ask them to participate, and as a thank you, they can download a small mobile app for their smartphone that every 20 minutes there's like a handsome guy or a beautiful woman doing some stretching exercises and inviting you to join so that you can keep your back and your neck and your shoulders active all day. Now, this research design, as you know, at, uh, creating a survey and asking people to respond to the survey is less precise and is less reliable as an instrument, right? It is an inferior research design. Who of you think that this is a better analysis nevertheless? Okay. Who of you think like, ah, research, like the surveys, etc. just give me the damn data? I think that the inferior research design actually is better because you have consent. People do know that uh, what you're analyzing about them, and there is no conflict with the community website. In fact, it is a win-win situation, which is essentially a modern definition of ethics anyway. You're doing something that is good for everyone. You help people not having neck and back problems, and you help creating a healthier um, uh, profit or a healthier cost structure for your organization at the same time. So, next example, next day, you're back in the office again. Good night of rest, and you have another idea. Let's have a look at dental insurance today. And within three minutes, because you had this brainwave, you figured out that 20% of all customers that upgrade their dental insurance make use of the, the upgrade within six weeks after doing that. This is essentially the first style of analysis, right, compared to the checking the web log statistics. You do not ask for consent. Who of you think that this is not the right analysis to do? It's exactly the same as the previous one. Who of you believe that there is no issues of doing that? Why is that? Why are there no issues? There is no con you didn't ask for, for consent. There is, uh, you didn't ask for permission, you just did it. You just analyzed it and found it. And you change, the, you change the coverage of the insurance and you say, like, it needs to take six months before you can make use of it. Exactly. There is no, and uh, you didn't induce any particular behavior, and it is also not confronting with the other things uh, that you're communicating with your customers. In fact, you are protecting your business here because you can argue that the whole idea of an insurance indeed is to create a lot of money for a lot of people to cover the needs of the few the moment it is there. So you create a buffer of money. The moment that lots of customers make use of that buffer, moments after they've opened it, they are exploiting almost a weakness in your business model there. And it is okay to protect yourself from that because there is not the right intent in this particular case from the customers. So although it is the same situation as the first analysis, in this particular case, it is okay. You see how important asking those questions about ethics really are and understanding the context of a specific case that you're analyzing. Let's go to one more example. You've got all the data mining tools in the world and boy are they advanced. What they do is send you an email every morning, 9 a.m., with the top 10 things it found in the data crawling through all the processes and crawling through all the data warehouses and crawling wherever what they do. And at one moment, one morning, you open up the email and on number one, it says that um, customers, in this case, you're not an insurance company, let's say you're a bank, customers over 65 have the highest fraud levels. Old people cheat. That's what the report says. Not a surprise to anyone, but nevertheless, who of you say, yep, that's what the data tells. I checked the uh, way how it was analyzed. It was perfectly done. The data mining tool didn't miss a beat. I perfectly understand the, um, the analysis. This is correct information, and I have no problem with it. Anyone? Old people cheat. 
No one has a problem with that. Uh, no one has a problem with that. Or do you have a problem with it? I did, yes, of course, there's interpretation, blah, blah, you did your homework, etc. All people do cheat. <laughs> Who of you would be happy for that email to be on the front page of USA Today tomorrow? And who of you would happily talk to the journalist on the phone and saying, yeah, 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 we've got this incredibly advanced data mining tool. It's statistically all correct, but don't worry, we won't do anything with that information. What would the journalist do with you? Kill you in public. What would your boss do with you? Kill you in public again. We would not feel comfortable with that information becoming public. Now, the weirdest thing about this particular example is that, in this case, the technology is answering questions that weren't even asked. So you can think and you can say in what the philosophers call a consequentialist way, it is okay based on what you do with the information. It might be true, but I choose not to use it, so therefore it is okay. There are no ethical, there are no moral concerns. But there's another school of thinking, the universalist school of thinking, that think you should know, you should be able to know better. You should know upfront what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. And technology doesn't even give you the chance anymore. How many BI tools do you know that have an unlike button? <laughs> Facebook doesn't even have an unlike button. There are no BI tools in the world that have an unlike button that say like, you know what, this was great information, don't ever do it again. <laughs> Who of you have policies in place, have a data strategy that talk about the ethical concerns of the stuff that you figure out by accident or that the technology figures out? These, this thinking is clearly not very well developed in most organizations, and it is scary as hell, because these problems are real, and we've only seen the beginning of it. So, we played around with three simple questions. What is true, what is real, and what is good? And I'm going to end again with one question. How many philosophers does it take to change a light bulb. Nah, that should be easy by now. Yeah? About 700, I would say. One to actually change the light bulb, and 699 to visit a conference and discuss how Nietzsche would have done it. Thank you very much for your attention. Two more things. One, I'm a technology laggard, and I just started Twittering three months ago. I'm such a loser. <laughs> but please, follow me. I need followers. <laughs> Two, if you thought that this was a fun presentation and you'd like to know more, then on Wednesday afternoon, attend the only class that is going to be guaranteed PowerPoint free. No slides. Just discussion. This was one of the best scoring uh, workshops last year at TDWI Europe. So do attend that one. In case you didn't like what you hear and it scared the jeepers out of you, then attend as well, because then you know uh, what questions you should be asking yourself. And thank you, Paul, so much for allowing this shameless plug for my uh, classes on, uh, on Wednesday. So thank you again. Thank you, Frank. Um, I think we're at uh, 8.45, so thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, the classes are downstairs one level. Executive Summit is right next door. So enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you very much.